My name is Ricardo Reis. I'm a Portuguese economist who's currently the A.W. Phillips Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. I'm originally from Portugal. I was born and raised outside of Porto. And I went to study in England for my undergraduate and did my PhD in the U.S. at Harvard University. I was an assistant professor at Princeton and a full professor at Columbia University before taking my current position at the LSE. I have done work in macroeconomics, broadly understood, with special emphasis on inflation dynamics, automatic stabilizers, the Phillips curve, uh, safe bonds in the euro crisis, and a variety of other topics that uh, excite me over time. So a topic that I've continuously done research on for now the 15 years since my PhD has been the dynamics of inflation. I think inflation is one of the key macro variables that we're supposed to explain. I think its behavior over time is fascinating insofar as it is one of those macro variables that change, has changed dramatically over time, that is very different across countries, it's very different within the where you can see how policy makes a difference insofar as different policy frameworks have really led to very different outcomes. And moreover, and finally, because inflation has a clear impact on people's welfare, you do see that the amount of economic destruction, if you want, in countries to go through hyperinflation shows that this is a very important and relevant topic. So my work on that has been multifaceted, if you want, or I've thought about inflation from different perspectives. I did some work some quite a bit of time ago on the Phillips curve. Why is it that we have a link between inflation and real activity? Or more importantly, why is it that monetary policy can affect inflation while facing a trade-off between inflation and output? So I did quite a bit of work on trying to understand why we have a Phillips curve. Um, I thought imperfect information, or in my particular approach, sticky information, was a promising way to think about what generates the Phillips curve. I also did some work on the persistence of inflation, more econometric work, as well, especially on coming up with measures of what, what's known as pure inflation, that is separating from the dynamics of inflation, what is the bit that is pure and neutral in the sense of being a homogeneous increase in the prices of all goods, as opposed to the movements in the real, uh, sorry, in the relative prices of those goods. So there's a, quite a bit of different forms of statistical work that I've done trying to separate different components of the change in inflation. Now, perhaps the main driver of that my imperfect information work on the Phillips curve taught me about uh, what drives inflation is expectations of agents. And that led me to look at surveys and do some work saying that whereas before People used to look only at the first moment of inflation expectation surveys. That is, what was the mean or what was the median expected inflation by households or professionals. I said, let's look at the second moment. Let's look also at disagreement. Because theories of imperfect and seek information suggested that disagreement was as or more important than the first moment. And I ended up discovering a series of, I thought, interesting facts about the disagreement. And that's led to a very interesting literature showing how that disagreement evolves over time using, using these surveys. More recently, I've also started looking at how financial prices of inflation for inflation, meaning inflation options, uh, index bonds, and others reflect the expectations of inflation both in the short and in the long run, and how that allows us to better understand again where inflation is going by doing these measures and trying to relate them, especially with how can they be made coherent with the work on surveys. Finally, still inflation as a policy tool. I have done quite a bit of research on trying to understand to what extent can different, uh, different amounts of inflation, or if you want different regimes on inflation, can have an impact on the fiscal revenues for the government and the fiscal implications for the central bank. That is how inflation can be used to inflate the debt or not, to generate seniorage or not, and or can interfere and lead to trade-offs with fiscal goals. Well, in some current research, I've been thinking about to what extent can central banks, or more generally policy, lead to the usage of a currency, or to promote the usage of that currency in an international setting. It is quite striking how the Federal Reserve Act in 1914 in the United States, and a very aggressive, purposeful policy of promoting the use of the dollar, led in the space of 15 years to the dollar going from being essentially not used in international payments, in, in the um, not only international payments, but also in uh, invoicing, as well as in denomination of financial assets, to becoming a dominant currency very quickly. Moreover, you look 100 years later, post-2011, and when 
the Chinese government, especially the People's Bank of China, had as a priority trying to get the RMB to start being more used and including the IMF basket. And again, they did a series of purposeful policies and they worked quite successful. The RMB went from a 0% share in world payments to something like a 3% share in world payments in the space of only a few years, which led and culminated in its inclusion in the IMF's SDR basket. So there are policies that it's so what becomes a, a dominant currency or an international vehicle currency is not purely dependent on non-policy fundamentals, but seems to depend also on or that governments or policymakers can boost those presents, can jumpstart the use of their currency. So I'm quite interested in understanding which types of policies allow for this to happen. Also looking forward to possible applications to the euro, where in the case of the euro, since the crisis, the role of the international payments has declined quite considerably. And to what extent can the ECB, looking forward, learn from the experience of the People Bank of China in the last five years, learn from the experience of the Federal Reserve in the 1910s and 20s, and in doing so, try to boost the rule of the euro. Thank you.